Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We are delighted to have you here at the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence here at Case Western Reserve University for this 2010 International Peace and War Summit. My name is Shannon French. I'm the director of the Inamori Center. And today I have the great privilege of being the moderator of the first panel. We have brought uh, quite a collection of very distinguished scholars here for you to listen to and to engage with. Uh, we will be having a conversation up here for a while, and then you'll notice in the center aisle there is a microphone. And at, w at a certain point, I will open the floor to questions from the audience. And at that point, uh, please um, make your way to the microphone. You can form a, a small line behind it. Uh, and and uh, take your questions from there. We are filming, so we do need the microphone to be used. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our panelists this morning. Uh, in the uh, center seat there, we have Rear Admiral Wendy Carpenter. Rear Admiral Carpenter now serves as Commander, Navy Warfare Development Command in Norfolk, Virginia. A naval aviator, she was assigned as the Navy's first selectively retained graduate instructor pilot. She is a distinguished graduate of the Naval War College. She has held a total of five commands at the commander, captain, and flag level in the area of logistics, aviation, and fleet operations, and, cons uh, and has worked with uh, concept generation, capability development, and all of this has helped to give her a unique war fighting perspective. Her awards, which are many and indeed too many to list here, do include the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, and the Meritorious Navy Commendation Medal. At the far end of the panel, raise your hand, <laughs> is uh, Professor Henri Oud, who comes to us. Uh, he is the head of the Centre for Ethics Research at the Saint Cyr Military Academy in France. Professor Oud is best known for his groundbreaking interdisciplinary work in ethics, metaphysics, political philosophy, political science, and world policy. He is the distinguished author of many books, many of which have been translated into multiple languages. He founded the Centre for, for Ethics at the saint -Cyr Military Academy and has headed it since 2004. In 2005, he was honored with the Monial Prize and in 2008 with the prize of the saint -Cyr Foundation. Immediately to my right is Professor Asa Kasher. Professor Kasher is currently the Laura Schwartz-Kipp Professor Emeritus of Professional Ethics and Philosophy of Practice and Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Tel Aviv University in Israel. Professor Kasher has written more than 200 papers and several books in various areas of philosophy, including military ethics, which won the National Prize for Military Literature. Professor Kasher wrote the first Code of Ethics for the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, an IDF document on the military ethics of fighting terror and an IDF document on the ethics of disengagement. He has served as a chair or member of numerous governmental and other public bodies. And in 2000, he won the Prize of Israel, the highest national prize for his contributions in philosophy. Immediately uh, to, uh, next to Professor Kasher is Professor George Lucas. George Lucas is the class of 1984 Distinguished Chair in Ethics in the Vice Admiral James B. Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership at the United States Naval Academy, my former home, <laughs> and Professor of Ethics and Public Policy at the Graduate School of Public Policy at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He has taught at several universities and is uh, three times served as the director of the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institutes for College and University faculty. 
He is the author of many works, including five books, more than 40 journal articles, translations and book reviews, and has also edited eight book-length collections of articles in philosophy and ethics. He is also co-editor of texts that are used in core courses devoted to ethics and ethical leadership at the United States Naval Academy, the United States Air Force Academy, and Naval ROTC units at over 57 colleges and universities throughout the United States. With the bow tie, <laughs> we have Professor Noel Sharkey. Professor Sharkey is a professor of AI and robotics and a professor of public engagement at the University of Sheffield in England, although he himself is Irish. <laughs> and previously, he worked at Yale in AI, Stanford in psychology, Essex in linguistics and cognitive science, and Exeter in computer science. He is uh, uh, responsible for having authored more than 100 academic articles and books. He writes for national newspapers and magazines and has created thrilling robotics museum exhibits and mechanical art installations. His core research is in the ethical applications of robotics in domains such as the military, child care, elder care, policing, medicine, and crime. Professor David Wedham. Our final panelist is a senior lecturer at the Defense Studies Department of King's College London, based at the Joint Services Command and Staff College at the UK, UK Defense Academy. David initially took a degree in philosophy at the London School of Economics and went on to earn a PhD at King's College London in War Studies. Professor Wedham also worked as a BBC researcher and with the OSCE in Kosovo. His main research areas are focused on the ethical dimensions of warfare and the development of the laws of war. He has been a visiting fellow with the Center for Defense Leadership and Ethics in the Australian Defense College in Canberra and has also taught at the Baltic Defense College and the Kuwaiti Staff College, as well as teaching officers from over 50 countries that join the British students at the UK Staff College annually. As a side note, he also fences with the medieval longsword. <laughs> but hopefully not on the panel today. I would like to begin with an opening question to our panelists uh, that will start our ball rolling. Gentlemen and, and lady, <laughs> have there been any 21st century game changers that have forced a significant reevaluation or even reimagining of the ethics of war? Or are we able to apply all the traditional rules of war to modern combat despite changes in tactics and technology? Who would care to begin? George. Well, I'll just toss out a thought on that and mm -hmm. then let the other panelists respond. And it's um, a caution that <laughs> As I think about that question, <laughs> the answers are sort of no and no. <laughs> uh, that if you think back to the invention of the catapult uh, by Archimedes, uh, every new technological innovation or the Mongolian horde sweeping out of Asia, whatever is the new form of warfare has always been predicted to be to upset everything and war is never going to be the same, will become savage and brutal as the war hadn't already been savage and brutal. Um, and oftentimes these new technologies and these new forms of warfare turn out to be things that can be assimilated within the, the familiar ways we have of arguing about this, this activity. Um, on the other hand, there are some potential game changers like cyber war. Uh, is it war at all? Uh, is it, does, it, does it present us with some new challenges that our conventional ideas of fighting justifiable wars um, uh, simply wouldn't be able to encompass. Some have argued that it, it does, and we need to think more carefully about it. Emerging military technologies and certainly irregular war and uh, humanitarian intervention and so forth have, have presented us with some challenges in the way in which we think about the traditional uses of force for self-defense or for um, law enforcement in the international community. Yes, Asa. My, if your answer is no and no, my answer is yes and yes. 
Uh, and I think, I mean, a no is a soft no, and a yes is a soft yes, indeed. I mean, there are different levels on which we see norms uh, related to warfare. You start with the troops that, have, that get commands and uh, have to know their rule of engagement, rules of engagement. You, then you see policies, you see doctrines, you see principles of uh, just war, you see fundamental moral principles, and, and, uh, and you see at the rock bottom uh, the pursuit of peace. Only the pursuit of peace has not changed. I mean, the, uh, the duty, uh, the, the idea that peace is the best situation and we ought to pursue it constantly, that has been left intact. But everything else has changed because the, all the other arrangements that we are familiar with rest on certain assumptions that took into account the ordinary form of warfare, mm -hmm. namely the international armed conflict. There is a state here and a state there. This state has, an armed, has armed forces, this one has, has armed forces, and those armed forces clash with each other. I mean, that's gone. Uh, and what we see is a state here with its armed forces and other branches and organizations individuals, semi-military forces, militias, and all kinds of other, other types of bodies that uh, are engaging the other party. And, and therefore, since the, the general forum is different, all kinds of assumptions have collapsed. For example, the assumptions of uh, international law uh, Geneva Conventions related to states. The assumptions are, first of all, reciprocity, which means that politicians sign the, the conventions, not philosophers, right? <laughs> and, and so the politicians sign the, the, the conventions because it's worth the while. Because, and it's worth the while because of reciprocity. I'm not going to kill your citizens, you're not going to kill my citizens. I'm going to spare the life of your POWs, you're going to spare the life of my POWs. So, so it's fair, and it's the reciprocity is crucial for the willingness of those politicians to sign those conventions. Secondly, there is the assumption of practicality. Okay, we can tell apart combatants from non-combatants by, by simply looking at them. They, they wear the uniforms. They bear the guns openly. Now, reciprocity has gone. Practicality has gone. So we need a whole reinterpretation of the principles of just war and everything above it, which means policies, doctrines, needless to say, rules of engagement and, and commands. There are, the moral foundations are there, the pursuit of peace is there, but all the rest has to be reconsidered. Hmm. David, yes. Um, I don't think we can have a military panel without mentioning the dead Prussians, so let's get him in early. <laughs> um, Clausewitz makes clear the distinction between the character of war and the nature of war. The nature of war is enduring, it does not change. The character of war has to change as the nature of war manifests itself in the real world. So I think the question is, have there been fundamental game changes? In the character of war, yes, of course. The character of war has changed enormously in many ways, as it has done throughout the Middle Ages, through the 20th century, into the 21st century. We've already had cyber warfare mentioned, mm -hmm. the growing use of standoff weaponry, um, remote killing, uh, the, 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 new, um, the new environment makes it clear that the character of war is constantly evolving and constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that the rules are going to have to change? Mm -hmm. The rules, yes. But the rules are simply how we apply the underlying ethical principles. Uh -huh. And I would say that those, along with the nature of war, do not actually change. The underlying ethical principles need to be reinterpreted for the new environment, but they are still very valid. May I, uh, just a point of clarification, those underlying principles to which you refer, uh, do you mean, for example, the, the basics like proportionality and uh, the, the, uh, something also that Asa mentioned, the uh, distinction, distinguishing between combatants and non-combatants, that those remain the same, but the application becomes challenged in different... I, I think, absolutely, I think the application of them may be harder in many ways, but it's nothing new in the sense that these have been fundamentally posed throughout history and have had to be interpreted according to the context that is there. Yes, Admiral. I, 
we had a, a yes and yes and a no and no and so <laughs> So you're you're almost saying like a maybe and a maybe. Yes. And, <laughs> and, and actually, left. <laughs> which is no, and th and that's what you know. I would say that it depends because mm -hmm. if you're talking about state on state conflict, then mm -hmm. certainly those kinds of things that we have always done mm -hmm. um, apply. Mm -hmm. Since we are now talking about different kinds of what I call actually irregular challenges, not necessarily warfare. Sometimes it's actually short of warfare mm -hmm. that some that some entity may be. Uh, executing tactics designed to accomplish some goal in mind for them, but it actually stops short of warfare. And I think, you know, certainly uh, my my own job, I I try to envision what is the future and what are potential um, game changers from a technology standpoint or from an application of technique and tactics, and then I try to influence the policy and the doctrine that will give at least maritime forces and joint forces as I interact with those folks the ability to um, to execute the kinds of things we need to. Technology-wise, there are certainly um, major changes that have come about, the cyber piece that we mentioned, um, that that may even be again that may be short of warfare it may be an interaction that someone does but is it a declared war as as we have have had in the past mm -hmm. so certainly we have to from a policy perspective and a political perspective have that open dialogue across not only nations but non-governmental organizations that that are now very prevalent in in the dialogue out there and in in the way that we do things um, when you think about the humanitarian interventions or the kinds of things that we're now doing um, many people think that you know Haiti's a great example the mm -hmm. the kinds of interactions and things that we did in Haiti but I would say to you that that from a maritime perspective uh, the US Navy has been active in humanitarian assistance for many many years mm -hmm. I am actually writing operational level doctrine right now to to codify what we've been doing tactically for a long time and even from a financial standpoint in the last I'd say probably six or seven years we've actually moved to put money into the budget every year that allows us to go out and do those kinds of humanitarian assistance pieces with our forces, with our, our um, hospital ships like Mercy and Comfort mm -hmm. to actually go out and, and do those things because we look at them as security force assistance that builds up the capabilities of other nations or entities to actually do self-defense for themselves so that we don't have those kinds of non-state um, actors that come in and and create uh, those irregular challenge environments for us. So that areas that, that uh, have humanitarian crises can end up being a, a breeding ground for, for future Absolutely, conflicts. Absolutely, because those addressed. are much the same with where we are active in the Horn of Africa and working on um, the piracy issues. The piracy issues have been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, the kinds of breeding ground that come, you know, that, that then generate those environments that allow those types of, of operations to be going on have been going on for a long time. The solution to piracy is not um, more Navy vessels out interdicting. Um, certainly we're going to continue to do that, and we do that, by the way, in a coalition way. We are very interoperable with a number of other navies, um, both with designed uh, counter piracy task forces, the uh, command of which has moved from a number of different entities. Pakistanis have had command, the Brits have had command, the Australians have had command of that entity. But we also have other ships out there operating independently. Mm. However, we we also have the Fifth Fleet Commander in the in the region actively working with interoperability and the legality policy issues in the State Department to make sure that if we in fact take take on pirates and we interdict them and arrest them, what do we then do with them? Because we don't want to keep them for forever. So you have to translate them you know, back into Kenya or some other area that's willing to actually prosecute them. So it's really a, the solution set is not only a military one, it's a it's across the diplomatic and information pieces as well that we have to be working in, mm. and also economics. Mm. Henri or Noel, would you care to comment on this? Yeah. Well, we'll comment on that, but I'll no, on the original. Answer. Yes. Well, you, uh, you've used up all the combinations now, so I just say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've we've done no, no, yes, yes, and yes, maybe, and maybe, maybe. maybe. So there's I can't nothing even left. Remember what the original question was. Now. <laughs> so I don't know what I'll be saying. I'll say yes and maybe, but maybe it's maybe and yes. <laughs> 
Uh, my biggest concern, I suppose, is about uh, one is technology because I'm a technologist, mm -hmm. and also about the safety of civilians. Mm -hmm. And I think there are massive changes. George mentioned since the catapult, of course, there's always complaints of the long lance. There's complaints <laughs> from everyone, and I think that one of the problems is that you've got a very, very rapid pace of technological development now, much greater than you've ever seen before, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to keep up with it. Now, what I would say is that the, from what I know of the international humanitarian law and international law, things are pretty much in place for protecting civilians. But what you've got is it's the mapping between each new technology and those laws that is problematic. Mm -hmm. So it, with a very fast accelerating pace, there's a, like all law, as you know, there are ambiguities. There are always ambiguities in laws. And what new technology allows people to do, states to do, is to exploit those ambiguities, mm -hmm. to find loopholes in the law and do things that, you know, it might take 10 years for the United Nations to argue about and get changed. And I think one of the things, for instance, and I, I won't go on too long because otherwise I'll have nothing else to say for the rest of the question. <laughs> uh, but one of the things is the, the uh, CIA use of, the, of drones, uh, drone strikes, and how that relates to Article 51 and self-defence. Now we need clarity there. We need to disambiguate that law. And could find could out I trouble really you? Could you just uh, tell the, if anyone in the audience doesn't know what uh, Article 51 of the UN Charter basically is? Um, I wish you hadn't asked me that. <laughs> I can't recite it to you. But it basically says you've got a right to self-defense. I think mm -hmm. that would be a simple, simple one-line summary. Mm -hmm. uh, but what does self-defense mean? I mean, what's the reach of self-defense? Because one thing that these new weaponry gives you is a greater facility to do things that you couldn't have done before. Mm -hmm. And actually, you talk about weapons being more accurate. And of course, drones, for instance, are much better than carpet bombing. <laughs> Uh, of course, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't go carpet bombing. You couldn't go carpet bombing Somalia or the Yemen, mm -hmm. but you can, because of the sort of illusion of accuracy, take a drone in there and kill individual people. Mm -hmm. And what's the due process for that? So we really need to look at these laws pretty, pretty carefully. Mm -hmm. um, and other things that are changing as well is the whole notion of risk-free mm -hmm. or fear-free warfare. Mm -hmm. And the idea, what everybody's pushing towards, is that you don't put your soldiers at risk ever. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever watched that Star Trek one where Captain Kirk gives a whole speech about the nature of war it has to be really gory and brutal because that's what stops it stops us doing it all the time. Yes, I'm on record as a Star Trek fan. So oh, you yes, are okay. <laughs> but the idea, the idea of uh, having no body bag kind. Now, I like everybody else don't like to see body bags coming home. Nobody wants to see our young soldiers being killed. But they're a great inhibitor, particularly with the public. If the public don't see body bags coming home, you can start wars all over the place, and they're not even wars because you can take uh, uh, robots I'm talking about really you can take your robots in and do all sorts of things and nobody's going to complain so there are worries here about how that fits with the laws of war and you just need discussion about it I don't I don't think mm. we need to change the laws of war though mm. just clarify uh, Henri did you well basically I agree with the uh, lady and gentlemen mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> that on one head there is nothing nothing new under the sun and at the same time uh, Bergson wrote uh, Henry Bergson wrote mm -hmm. that uh, reality was a, a, a process of uh, continually emerging uh, of a uh, improvisable novelty mm -hmm. and uh, well, among these uh, among these new aspects uh, it seems to me that few of them, uh, uh, apart from technology, mm -hmm. talked, just talked about, um, new aspects deeply impact the character of war. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are uh, globalization ah. and uh, prosperity. Mm -hmm. um, among the um, traditional uh, conditions for uh, just war, uh, which are listed in the just war theory, we find legitimate authority. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is legitimate uh, authority? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to go into the UN national powers, alliances, and so on uh, issue, but I would like to uh, call your attention to the growth of a non-constitutional power, but which is an overwhelmingly powerful power, and she's are the media, you know? And, um, well, it started during uh, 
the first Gulf War, um, it is clear that a democracy needs a free uh, press, you know, uh, but free and responsible information and responsible uncensored press yes uncensored but at the same time was self control by high morality not only a, bi a business you know not only a business mm. uh, i remember having read a book uh, written by um, uh, uh, a british uh, john lloyd about uh, what the media do to our politics mm. and a recent book uh, two or three years ago and um, well, it seems to me that we should uh, we should uh, question how the reason reasonableness and uh, of the public opinion at large and of the policy makers uh, is impacted by a certain way of uh, information information making information giving which sometimes uh, means more uh, uh, public appealing you know yeah. than uh, and business making than uh, exercising a, re a citizen re responsibility mm -hmm. well uh, well and the second point i would like to uh, and this is a big uh, real real problem of uh, military ethics at large you know not not only focusing on uh, uh, what well, a casuistry of the soldier or of the military personnel what I'm permitted to do what I'm uh, not permitted to do but uh, this is the responsibility of the political leadership and of society at large and of the elite mm -hmm. which are uh, which are called uh, for um, more oh, again yeah. We are very uh, aware right now of uh, PTSD, for instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, uh, the veteran need to be welcome when they come home. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, they just cannot uh, stand a new condition, mm -hmm. and most of them are drawn in this into despair. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, we, it seems to me that we have to uh, address the problem of the gap between the values of, a soci of society when it gets it's getting wealthier and easier, you know. And fewer people are in the service. Yes, and because the values of, of an army uh, or a, a military force at large, you know, uh, well, remain the same. Mm -hmm. It is all about, um, I would say, selflessness mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, and discipline and forgetting uh, forgetting oneself and so on. So. Uh, and if if the gap is too large, too wide, uh, mm -hmm. uh, between the values of society and the values, the values of democracy and the values of um, of the military personnel, so what does it mean mm -hmm. that the democracy is not able to defend itself? And so, how will it survive? Mm -hmm. So, this is a problem of enduring democracy. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Professor Kasher wanted to comment. Uh, two brief comments with your permission. Yes. First of all, I mean, we seem to assume that the principles that we have known and perhaps followed to a certain extent until now, until 20th, 21st century, are okay as mm -hmm. they are. And they should be kept as much as possible mm -hmm. and uh, not revised. Well, I beg to differ. <laughs> Take, for example, the distinction between combatants and non-combatants. Mm -hmm. Think about the combatants. I mean, what the, the attitude that is shown in the literature and in practice too, in pol political practice and in the media, media expressions, is that combatants are instruments, mm -hmm. okay, the disposable instruments. They are bound to, they, they have the right to kill and they are bound to be killed. So who cares about them? I mean, they should just win us the war. Mm -hmm. Non-combatants are sacred. Mm -hmm. Okay, they should not be touched. Now, this cannot be morally justified. I think that that kind of attitude, mm -hmm. those ones are sacred, that's perfectly all right. Those are just instruments mm -hmm. that's perfectly wrong. And they are not instruments. 
they are citizens of, think about certain, think about some of the states, that they are citizens of democracies. Mm -hmm. They have, you, they are entitled to the protection of the human dignity, whether in military uniform or not. Mm -hmm. They never lose their rights to have their human dignity protected. So they play a certain role, right? They risk themselves, they risk others, they kill, and unfortunately many of them get killed. Mm -hmm. However, the moral, the moral situation of a combatant in war has to be changed, even if we, don't, we haven't seen, hadn't we seen a single terrorist. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should have changed the, the significance of the protection of the, of the combatant. Secondly, I mean, the idea of protecting non-combatants, it sounds very simple, but it's very complicated because mm -hmm. there are non-combatants on both sides of the battle line, battle mm -hmm. line all right? Mm -hmm. So a certain state tries to protect its own non-combatant. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to do that, it has to attack the other side. Now, the other side has also, has also non-combatants. Mm -hmm. Now, if the nature of the war uh, not the nature, the character of the war is like that. That missiles are launched from residential areas, right? So in order to protect your non-combatants, you have to attack the missile launchers who have many neighbors or non-combatants. Mm -hmm. So just protection of non-combatants non is the name of a problem. It's not the name of a constraint mm -hmm. or a solution. You have, to, you have to get very accurate and morally justified doctrines and principles that would tell you what to do under such circumstances. Just non-combatants should be protected. It's not, it's, no, no, not enough. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, take a few more comments, but I just want to articulate, uh, this was actually the next question on my list as it happens, and we've blended quite naturally into it, so let me just put it out there as it will, I think, affect uh, the, the forthcoming comments. How much additional risk should regular combatants have to accept in order to reduce the risk to non-combatants? And is the answer dependent on the precise nature of the conflict? So that is a question very much on my mind, and I would like to hear some further comments on that. Uh, if you'd start us off, George. Sure. Um, I suspect, by the way, that the members of the audience probably want to get into this pretty soon, and there's a <laughs> lot of stuff on the table here that uh, that people would have strong opinions about it or, or probing questions. They are formulating their questions. And, I can yeah. see it. <laughs> and so to keep that sort of mm -hmm. uh, dynamic alive, just flag quickly some things that Noel mentioned about technology and the way in which it outpaces law and governance and ethics and how we have to keep up with trying to you know, figure out how to map our existing conceptions of acceptable behavior and constraints on behavior onto new technologies. The great fear of those is always that they will lower the threshold for war. That is, instead of making war less destructive and more discriminant, or in fact by doing that, they will also make it easier for governments to use war as an instrument of, of conflict resolution because the public will not notice it so much and won't notice the cost to them. Uh, those costs will be hidden or perhaps even non-existent, at least to one side. So keep that one alive on the technology side and then return to this issue that uh, Asa mentioned for us. And that is that we might want to ask what the difference is between a warrior, a soldier, and a domestic policeman, a law enforcement. Um, imagine, uh, as Admiral Carpenter mentioned, the Haiti operation and the American Navy helping out there. People wearing naval uniforms, providing food, also carrying weapons, and providing security in a time of chaos. Are they legitimate targets of violence because they're military personnel? The conventional way we understand war, to go back to Professor Kasher's uh, distinctions earlier, is that combatants are entitled or given permission to kill each other, shoot at each other. They also sort of consent or there's something we call the war convention or the moral equality of soldiers that says once you're in a, an armed conflict between conventional nation states that the, the warriors on both sides are uh, liable to attack. Um, and that that's not in itself a crime to shoot at them, whereas the non-combatants, the civilians, have not 
lost their rights not to be shot at. And, and this is the thing that he's, he's questioning. In irregular warfare, or in these irregular challenges, as Admiral Carpenter called them, um, I think rightly, they're, they're, they're not even war at all. Haiti is not a war. <laughs> uh, what we're trying to do is prevent a state from failing in the aftermath of a tragedy. Mm -hmm. In that case, I'd submit that the, uh, and in many of these instances, our, our soldiers and sailors are behaving more like security forces or domestic constabularies. They're there to provide order and safety for vulnerable victims of disasters or political chaos. Mm -hmm. And while it's a dangerous job and they could get shot at and killed, they don't, no one has permission mm -hmm. or license to shoot at them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not, it, 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 the job is risky, mm -hmm. but it doesn't include a legal entitlement for them to become targets of violence when they're engaged in those activities. I think the game changer, at least one very important game changer, is many more of the conflicts in which we find our militaries involved are of that sort. They're like fighting international criminal conspiracies as opposed to fighting conventional wars against enemy nations. And that means at once that our soldiers must subject themselves in a way to somewhat more risk by trying to be um, uh, c constrain the resort to the use of force on their part, mm -hmm. not shoot at the people they're protecting, but at the same time they're not any longer legitimate targets of an enemy. There, there is no enemy. Mm -hmm. There are only people who are out to foment chaos. Mm -hmm. And so how to figure that out in the mm -hmm. context of our current conflicts is, is really a challenge. Oh, we have several. <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, Admiral and then Noel and then Henri. Okay. Um, first of all, back to the question, you said how much risk. Yes. Um, I'm not sure you can answer that. Um, I like to ask unanswerable could, questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, I was sure that you did, and, and you know, and and I like to have answers to questions. But those are one of those. That's one of those areas where, you know, our policymakers, our politicians, when they make a decision to insert forces for whatever reason, mm -hmm. be it. Uh, because we're trying to do humanitarian assistance, which you know Haiti is clearly not, um, and there have been other instances where we've we've done tsunami relief and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of high-level policy discussion, particularly during the tsunami, about you know are you going to send forces in in uniform who are also carrying weapons? Uh. And the answer to that, much of the time, is no. We did mm -hmm. not do that mm -hmm. uh, because you you want to be able to have those people who are victims understand that we're there to help and to distribute food and care and not there to either occupy or do other things. The other distinction that it's very important to make is we do not insert forces into, for example, Haiti or where we did the tsunami relief. There were many areas we didn't actually go in and put anybody on the ground. We dropped some things in, but we let the non-governmental organizations distribute some of the supplies for the very reason that we were not invited in by by the local authorities or by mm. um, the embassy had to coordinate. So the military forces are always under um, our political leadership, even though we may have a joint task force commander which was stood up in Haiti, mm -hmm. we are ultimately having discourse on a regular basis and interaction with, with what we call the interagency or uh, the State Department or the Treasury Department trying to, trying to be an instrument of national power but not the sole instrument, mm -hmm. and so it's a it's an important distinction for those who are not necessarily that familiar with military that we are interacting all the time with the embassy and what the ambassador has told us to do, who is also conversely interacting with that host nation, and we have doctrine that and tactics and procedures as well as our uh, rules of engagement that should something you know transpire. Our forces are trained to know what they're supposed to do. There is what's called standing ROE, that is that self-defense kind of ROE. ROE being rules of engagement. Rules of engagement. But in situations where we're going to insert forces, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and Secretary of Defense and the combatant, what we call the combatant commanders in those particular areas, have the discussions about what do we need to do for those rules of engagement hmm. in every single scenario so that there is as much clarity as possible, even in ambiguous situations. And certainly there are those areas where forces inserted may be at risk that we don't even know. Mm. Conversely, you're at risk just wash, walking across the street or the policeman here is also. Mm -hmm. And so the, the kinds of activities that we engage in 
we have those conversations about rules of engagement before we ever begin to insert forces into those And very areas. specific to the scenario. Yes. Because and then can't. we adapt those rules of engagement if the scenarios look like they are changing. Mm -hmm. um, that's a discussion. Uh, one of the things that we have our, our judge advocate generals mm -hmm. routinely are, are what's called basically tattooed to the side of the combatant commanders because they always want to know what is what is the legal ramification and there's a regular dialogue up the chain of command mm -hmm. to talk to the policymakers in the White House for example with US forces about what would we do in certain circumstances mm -hmm. the same is true in Afghanistan or other areas where we have coalition forces we've reached coalition or ROE mm -hmm. to allow our forces to go in and have a good understanding of what they can do but by virtue of the fact that you're wearing a uniform and you're going into any situation you know that you're under a certain amount of risk and I'm just not sure you can ever say how much risk are you really willing to assume because you know as a volunteer you're going in and, and you may give up your life in a certain situation and, and may not be able to do anything about it. Hmm. No. Uh, well, I'm addressing your question, but really commenting on Asha, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, Asha's uh, work. Well, we've had this disagreement before. Uh, <laughs> I, I really agree with you about the dignity of soldiers and, and the right to protection, etc. But where we violently disagree, and I use the word violently here, mm -hmm. is in terms of the protection of civilians. Uh, for me, that's something that's inviolable. It should be set in stone and, and never touched. Mm -hmm. I think that all civilians equally should be protected. Uh, we send our soldiers in to fight, so we risk their lives in sending them to fight. But we don't risk other people's civilians' lives. It's a wrong thing. It's just wrong to kill people. I've even got problems with proportionality, but I won't go into that. It <laughs> might come up again later. One of the things, though, is that when you have, a, you have this notion of reciprocity, um, you've killed our civilians, so why shouldn't we kill yours? And that's wrong for a start, but it gets more problematic when you're dealing with insurgent warfares, mm -hmm. because when you've got a non-state actor, who are their civilians? Who are the Taliban civilians? If you go in, if you fly into uh, Pakistan and kill a bunch of German citizens, who are, who happen to be you know known insurgent leaders or whatever, and you kill some civilians there, those civilians aren't their civilians. How, how would the Pakistani uh, men and women or Pakistani children be the German civilians? So there's no idea here of reciprocity at all. It's completely wrong. Um, but another thing is that. Um, we talk about, and this is, I don't know the answer to this one, I'm just throwing it out there. We talk about um, uh, insurgency and it's on the increase and it seems that all wars from now on are going to be insurgent warfares. And why would that be? Well, one idea put forward simply is that we're causing it. We're actually the cause who's of the, the we rise. In that? We being, you know, the Western, the Western nations, nations okay. because we have all the military might. I don't know the answer to this and if this is true or not. But the thing is, the greater the asymmetrical warfare, what do people do? People, when you attack people, they just don't roll over and say, "Okay, you've, you've got the big guns. Let, let's just leave it at that." Now, what happens is the result, the way the IRA did against against the British many years ago, they could not fight the British and beat them on the battlefield, so they started using insurgency techniques, what we call terrorist techniques or ununiformed combatant techniques, because it's the only way they can fight. So if we carry on with more and more and more technology, more and more asymmetrical warfare, it is possible or likely that we're going to create more and more terrorism. And what we're doing in this idea of risk-free war, it's risk-free maybe to our servicemen and women, excuse me. <laughs> um, and, but what it isn't, it's not risk-free to our civilians. I mean, you could get to the point where if any of your civilians, United States civilians especially, because you've got the biggest guns, uh, I'm using guns here as, as a blanket term, uh, you might find that if you want to go abroad at all, you want to go on your sort of do Europe thing, you're going to have to take an armed guard with you. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. could happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Henri, you were waiting to comment. Would you like oh, to jump in and, well, and then, Aza, if you'd like to respond in a moment? Mm -hmm. Yes. But I had a comment to, on your specific question, but I would like to come back to uh, Asa and uh, uh, Mr. Sharkey's uh, opinions. Mm -hmm. Well, in the old times, mm -hmm. war was basically a, uh, among uh, two li political leaderships. Mm -hmm. The people were just obeying. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, a, a quarrel to be settled between the leaders mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and they're um, men of war. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the question of legitimate authority that you mentioned earlier was less there obscure. There was no problem, and oh. it, it was quite clear that, uh, except uh, cruelty and justifiable cruelty, the people should be left aside quietly. And uh, well. We have to address the question that democracy changes the the deal completely mm -hmm. because we we the we the people uh, mm -hmm. in each country uh, are uh, as it were the ruler of the ruler you know mm -hmm. we appoint the the rulers and so uh, the 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 reason the old reason for leaving the people outside uh, you know and respect it as non-combatant combatant. combatant mm -hmm. Um, well, it is more questionable than it was in non-democratic uh, times. And so we need additional uh, statements, which in fact we do not uh, have clearly, calling them well, in order to justify the fact that uh, enemy people, uh, well, uh, an adversary has no right. Moreover, you say, uh, you say it now, uh, that very often in our asymmetrical conflicts, um, l uh, there is no possibility for the adversary to have even uh, a political visible leadership. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so the, the situation becomes very confused. Mm -hmm. oh. So, uh, uh, very, sh very quickly, uh, should we take additional, ad some additional risk? Um, I would answer the question by another question. <laughs> I mean, who has to say mm. that these soldiers mm. or these military personnel mm. uh, should take in, uh, on, in the field some additional risk? Is it the platoon leader? Mm. Is it the battalion leader? Mm. Is it the co commander? Probably. Eh? Okay. Mm. So it seems to me that we, um, we are, this situation calls for uh, a full-fledged exercise of uh, moral responsibility mm. from the part of the political leadership, mm. okay? Yeah. And uh, mm. uh, there is a public choice to be made between, well, what is justice, what is self-interest, what is friendship, what is love, you know, and all this range, uh, it, it is clear that uh, depending the way we, uh, we list and, and hierarchize, hierarchize yes, mm -hmm. these principles or understand the way they are connected to each other, we will make pu different public choices. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that since it is so deep and so, um, and so serious, there, is, there will always be room for some kind of uh, legitimate mm -hmm. and uh, serious conscien conscientious objection, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, nevertheless, it is not possible to treat uh, warfare just as a matter of technical, mm -hmm. uh, of techniques mm -hmm. and tactics and uh, no there is an ethical aspect we have to concentrate in and which is the core of moral responsibility and that's again calls all of us for and the media for uh, being serious in provide in well in, in providing democracy with the ability of pushing the best up you know mm -hmm. and not only the most uh, uh, of the best look and so on. No, the <laughs> the most telegenic. Group. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> the most uh, what I'd like to do is let uh, um, Professor Kasher and uh, Professor Wedham make yeah, comments. Could I, could Would you, I, yes, I jump in before. here and then we'll I, let Asa, and then I'm, I'm going sure. to be opening it to the floor. So hopefully your questions <clears throat> are well formed in, in your minds. <laughs> um, j j just before, because I'm, I'm sure uh, Professor Kasher is going to disagree with me as well. But <laughs> just be worth we, getting we enjoy disagreement. <laughs> that, is, um, that is healthy. The, the, the question was how much additional risk should competence have to accept or yes. be prepared to accept. Um, and I just want to try um, and draw a couple of the threads together. Um, answering that, as the Admiral has already pointed out, as some kind of definitive formula that you can say yes or no or, or a percentage is, is, is not going to work. Mm -hmm. But what you can say as a statement of fact is if you have military personnel who are trained and equipped for the environment of conflict mm -hmm. and you have civilians who self-evidently aren't, mm -hmm. 
it seems pretty obvious which one is more likely to survive all other factors given e being equal mm -hmm. in a combat zone. Mm -hmm. Now the fact that the combatants should therefore be prepared to accept some additional risk to protect those combatants seems to me self-evident. Mm -hmm. Just flows from that very, very straightforward. Mm -hmm. Now the degree of risk to me comes to comes down to the character of the environment that you're actually in. Mm -hmm. the, the burden of um, risk transfer that you're prepared to accept is completely dependent upon the environment. If you're in a war of national survival, mm -hmm. clearly you're going to be willing to accept a higher civilian death toll from your military activity mm -hmm. and be prepared to accept that than you would be if you're in a, a humanitarian operation or a peacekeeping operation or a counterinsurgency operation. Mm -hmm. If you are there as, as, as um, as has already been pointed out, if, if you're there to protect the people, mm -hmm. the idea of transferring any risk to the civilian population mm -hmm. to protect yourself is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the police, if, you're, if you are being expected to be carrying out a policing role or a humanitarian role or an aid provision role, the idea that you should adopt a radical force protection mentality, shoot first, ask questions later, <laughs> to protect your force mm -hmm. is completely counterproductive, mm -hmm. as it would be in a counterinsurgency environment as well, where the idea is that you are trying to co-opt and bring aboard the local population. The winning hearts and minds Absolutely. idea? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so it, it, it's going to depend again upon the character of the conflict. Um, but what I would say, just following on from some other points, what is, what it is difficult to say how much risk mm -hmm. combatants should be willing, uh, should be prepared to accept to protect those civilians. If you remove the risk altogether to those combatants, in an idea that's already been raised here, if there is no risk, mm -hmm. if you are using completely uh, robotic or remote war, uh, cruise war, Oh, missiles, distance, distance war, yeah. If you are not actually placing your own forces at any risk at all, it's already been mentioned that this um, this appears to lower the threshold for the willingness to, to commit to going to war in the first place. Mm -hmm. There's no risk to you. It's a policy, mm -hmm. a very easy policy decision for a politician. Mm -hmm. um, there is no political cost to, to having military action. It's um, the illusion of um, uh, precision, mm -hmm. um, or the paradox of precision, or, almost, um, mm -hmm. means that you can use that force far, far more freely than you would otherwise be prepared to do. And because you're not, you're not risking your own personnel at all, well, why shouldn't you? The body bags aren't going to be coming home. Mm -hmm. It becomes a policy-free decision. It's easy. Not, uh, sorry, a risk-free policy decision. It becomes mm -hmm. an easier decision. But at the same time, what this actually seems to be demonstrating is a willingness to kill but not to die for a cause. Mm. Mm. And if you're prepared to kill but not die for a cause, what does this actually do to how you resolve the conflict? Mm. Where is the clash of wills? Where is the overpowering? What, what you're actually doing is demonstrating that um, you are, you're willing to, to kill but not die for a cause. You've actually invested nothing morally. Mm. There is no moral um, clash here. You are not demonstrating resolve. In mm. fact, you're demonstrating a lack of resolve, which means deterrence mm. can't work either. Mm. If you're demonstrating that you are not willing to die for something, you've actually demonstrated you're not willing to spend blood and treasure, you're only willing to spend treasure. Mm. You're actually demonstrating a fundamental lack of resolve. So I think the paradox here is on the one hand, a new generation of weapon systems is lowering the threshold to the use of military force while at the same time making it harder to use that military force successfully. Mm. It is actually making victory, in any meaningful sense, more remote, mm. while at the same time making the use of that force easier. Well, I'd like to give a, a, a respondent moment to, to um, Professor Kasher and then open it to the floor. If anyone would like to uh, begin to make a line at the microphone, please feel free to do so, and we will take the first question in just a moment. Please. Okay, <clears throat> two brief comments. Uh, one on reciprocity. One should understand the uh, role played by reciprocity. I mean, when politicians signed and then ratified Geneva Conventions, they did it for reasons of reciprocity. I mean, they gained and they gave something in return, and it was a fair, a fair arrangement. To this very day, when people, when states negotiate non-proliferation of all kinds of um, arms, and when they negotiate similar conventions, its reciprocity plays a role. They, you get and you give the same, about the same, the same type of, of, uh, of force. 
However, what happens when reciprocity is gone? This doesn't mean that if you kill my citizens, I'm going to kill your citizens. This means that reciprocity considerations do not work anymore. And we need other considerations. And it's a very interesting shift in, in, in the world, in the way the, world, the democratic world looks at, at, at affairs, that now it's not reciprocity considerations. We look at the mirror, and we would like to see a beautiful face, as beautiful as as possible, which means that we act on our constitutions, not because of reciprocity considerations, but because of adherence to our own constitutions. And democracies has right constitutions with all the differences among them. The, the American officer takes an oath to, the, to protect the Constitution, not the state or, or the commander-in-chief, but the Constitution, which means the values of that, of that state. So now, nowadays, democracies act for, according to their own views of what is right to do. And it's not reciprocity, but something else. But this creates a variety of views because they, although all of them are constitution, are democratic constitutions, they all are for the protection of human dignity, there are differences among them. Now, uh, we hope that there is a convergence and you get a, a doctrine for fighting terrorism that every democracy endorses and every democracy uh, acts according to, to which when, when, it has, when it has to, uh, to, to act. Now, to, to, to Shannon's question on additional risk. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I fully agree with George and the Admiral Carpenter when they say that under some circumstances of military activity, I mean military activity in the sense not it's of warfare, but it's, it's people in military uniform who do it. Uh, under some conditions, they are like police or firefighters. So a police officer or a firefighter risk their life in order to defend citizens of their own state. And that risk is acceptable and uh, heroic and commendable. And, and when troops are in somewhere playing the role of those who, uh, like in Iraq, say, they help the government to defend the citizens, then they risk themselves on, the, on a par with the risk that police officers risk themselves. However, there are other circumstances that we should not forget. Namely, when it's real war, it's real warfare. And there, there are circumstances under which my answer to the question, how much additional risk should a soldier or whatever take, the answer would be none. Hmm. There are some circumstances when the additional risk should not take place. And I'll give you a, 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 simple, a simple example. Uh, so, and and it's, a, it's a real example. It's from our uh, recent Gaza campaign, Operation Castlet. Okay, there are buildings full of magazines, full of terrorists, and full of the, the neighbors, the non-combatant neighbors of, of the terrorists. Now, there are operations taking place, risking, jeopardizing the life of our citizens uh, uh, across the border. Now, wh what should we do? What should we do? I mean, if we cannot attack a building where there are non-combatants because of all kinds of considerations, proportionality and, and similar ones, then what will emerge is that we have lost our ability to defend ourselves. Now, no set of rules that are morally justifiable can tell an attacked party you lost your ability to, to defend yourself. So, so what we should do, is, and what we actually did, is warn the neighbors, warn the neighbors of the, of the terrorists. First of all, warn them regularly that if your neighbor is a terrorist, then it's not like if your neighbor is a sage or is a saint, okay? It's a different situation. Secondly, uh, distribute leaflets. Thirdly, we made phone calls. We made hundreds of thousands of phone calls into your personal cell phone or, or, or in your apartment telling you that this apartment and this building is going to be attacked because of your neighbors. So please, please move to somewhere else and move to a, to a neighboring place because the bugs are smart. Because the risk to yourself, if you move a little bit, is diminished. Then. Uh, we can see by, by using the drones whether they have evacuated the buildings or not, the neighbors or not, and we see that it's effective. Warning is effective. 
And then to build the safe side, we use the uh, procedure that we call knock on the roof, which means they use a non-lethal type of weaponry shot from helicopters on the roof of a building. It kills nobody. You, you, it's precise, and, but it's very noisy. So it's a very strong hint, okay, which means that if there is someone there who is a neighbor of the terrorist and hasn't so far lit, I mean, we, we are about to, to get you, uh, to risk you, unfortunately. So, so usually they leave the, their houses. I mean, they're a reasonable person. Usually they're reasonable. They don't want to jeopardize their life because of the, of the terrorists, although those terrorists are their brothers or neighbors or whatever. Now, no. Assume that there is a possibility there that not everyone has evacuated the building. Okay. Now, here I represent the soldier. And in our case, in Israel, most of the combatants are conscripts, which means you serve in the military force because you were told to. They are drafted, essentially. Right. Yeah. You're not a volunteer. Okay, the commanders are volunteers. But they, they, the privates and sergeants are, are, are conscripts. Now I am a conscript, am I, I'm a citizen of a democracy, and I'm entitled to very good, compelling answers to the following question. Why do you jeopardize my life, being a citizen of, this, of a democracy? Now, why do you put on me uniform and, and, ask, and require me to service, require that I service three years? Perfect answer. Why do you send me to Gaza Street? Perfect answer. Why have you sent me to this neighborhood? Perfect answer. Now, you're sending me into the building where there are terrorists who are going to risk my life just to see whether there is someone is left there because he's afraid that his carpets are going to be stolen if he evacuates the, 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 uh, the apartment. Now, is the blood of a person who has voluntarily rendered himself a human shield rather than my blood? being a conscript who fights for, for the state and def for defending the, uh, the citizens? The answer is no. The state does not have an answer, a good, compelling answer. And all the answers in terms of the, uh, the, the, the combatants not being, uh, I mean, just being combatants, and therefore they forfeited all kinds of, of rights they have are, I mean, for me, as a representative of the soldiers, they are very weak not convincing at all. So under such circumstances, and there are others as well, the answer to the additional amount of risk is none. Well, I think we have a, a lot of uh, thought-provoking ideas uh, in this room already, and in, as proof of that, we have a long line uh, there at the microphone for questions. What I would like to say, and this is uh, to our questioners and also to our, our distinguished panelists, in the interest of time, uh, let's keep both our questions and our answers as concise as possible. We go until uh, 11 o'clock, so in order to uh, fit in as many of these uh, questions, which I'm sure will be quite thoughtful. We will try to keep moving at a steady clip. Sir, if you could ask your first question. Thank you. Uh, working. And please uh, just uh, state your name, if you would. Okay. I beg your pardon? Could you state your name first? Uh, Walter Nichols. Thank you, Walter. A World War II veteran. Ah, and a World War II veteran. Yes. Yeah, I, it's, uh, and could you speak into the mic as much yeah, as possible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I find it ironic that uh, we can talk at such length and with such knowledge and detail uh, about a war, about the process of uh, uh, killing each other, uh, members of our own species. I, I think it's remarkable that we can discuss this at such length, as though we were discussing angels on the head of a pin with such abstraction and not choke on our words. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Uh, I think one, once persons have uh, seen war close up, and with due respect, I would ask uh, how many on the panel have actually been in combat situations where you had to kill another person or they were trying to kill you. Uh, I think once persons have been in that situation and seen death and destruction close, war is no longer an abstraction for discussion. It's an, it's, a, it's an emotional issue that drives you to uh, simplistic, simplicity. Mm -hmm. I think the persons that we come to respect most when we're talking about war are those who can speak in the fewest words simply 
about ending war. And uh, so my question is, can any of you speak in the fewest number of words about means whereby humans can end the killing and destruction of each other? Thank you very much. Anyone like to uh, address? Yes, no, please. Fewest number of words to stop fighting each other. <laughs> Would anyone else like to comment? Asa. I don't accept, with all due respect, I don't accept the notion that only people who have been into a certain type of circumstances may comment on it. I mean, judges, for example, presumably, mm -hmm. have never been in any type of murder, rape, or burglary situation. This doesn't mean that they cannot pronounce their views concerning what is right and what is wrong under such circumstances. I've been under combat situations where I was a target. But this doesn't give me any privilege or any right. I mean, the issue is what are the justifications for a certain command, a certain rule of engagement, a certain doctrine, a certain policy. And those justifications must be outlined in abstraction. Indeed, they involve people. They involve casualties, they involve the wounded, they involve the, the killed, they involve the, the fallen and their, and their families. And all those are strongly emotional, emotional components of, of the situation. And they should be taken into account, not ignored. But there is there room for abstract justification of what should be done and what should not be done. Yes. With all due respect to you, Mm. Yes. Um, um, I, sorry. <laughs> I said, with all due respect to the gentleman and to his question, mm. I think what's most important is not the fewest number of words, but the reality of why we have to fight wars. My own father was a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Mm. I've served for 33 years, and I serve in the military because I believe that if we have strong militaries, we have a lesser chance of, in fact, going to war. Mm -hmm. But because of the human species and because of individuals who will drive situations to a point where if one wants to preserve the peace, one has to be willing to go to war. You have to understand the nature of warfare, the way you must fight it, and that way you can deter better those who might drive us to that point. Thank you very much. Next question, and please uh, state at least your first name. Uh, hello, my name is Kelly Hekla, and I have a question. Um, I read a statistic that the Afghanistan war that the U.S. is involved in is the longest war that the United States has been involved in. I don't know whether that statistic is true or not, but um, which started in like 2001 after 9-11. I was wondering if the reason that it had gone for such a long time was in fact these new methods of war where we're using robots and mm. sort of it, it it's not like a personal combat. It's more of a remote thing. And I was wondering if that was the reason why this war has been going on so long. Anyone? Uh, the simple answer is no. That's not why the war has been going on so long. Um, those are attributes and things that we are employing now. In many cases, the robotics that we are using on the ground are actually um, giving our soldiers and our folks, and, and you may not be aware that we have about 14,000 Navy personnel on the ground in Afghanistan and Iraq. Many people are, are unaware that we have so many people on the ground over there. Um, the robotics in many cases, and I do development of some of that myself in my own job, is because it allows us to have additional surveillance and reconnaissance whether or not those uh, like the UAVs are, are weaponized in some cases we can use those for surveillance uh, surveillance and reconnaissance that give us better information that in fact would help us in non-combatant situations to understand where the non-combatants are and be able to protect civilian lives better. Dr. Lucas were you trying to uh, comment on this as well? Well um 
It's a complicated question, in mm -hmm. fact, but I, I think you're right that certainly this is among the longest officially, you know, yeah. longest conflicts we've been involved in. Mm -hmm. um, Vietnam is the only other one that comes to mind as of similar length. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think it is possible for these nasty counterinsurgency wars to drag on mm -hmm. for much longer. I don't think it has anything to do with the, with the particular tactics or weapons that are mm -hmm. used, but the nature of the intractable conflicts that you're trying to resolve to some satisfactory level. Um, and I think that we'll see more and more of these kinds of sort of ugly, dirty little wars as opposed to, you know, huge conventional conflicts between nation states that uh, people are wailing the heck out of one another and, mm -hmm. and, and grow weary or exhausted or finally in a Clausewitzian sense or, or their will is broken to fight. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't happen in these, in these kinds of things. Um, and what to do about that and how to respond and how to prepare our, our troops for those uh, in indeed in the in the very way in which the first gentleman suggested that you know why shouldn't we be talking about ending these conflicts well if we can get people to either end conflict or resolve conflicts according to legal procedures mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that you argue with domestic criminals uh, mm -hmm. that it would be much better to use the law to adjudicate disputes than to take the law into your own hands but until we get there uh, we as in domestic law we do need the ability to resort to force sometimes to enforce the law and sometimes to protect vulnerable people who otherwise would be victimized mm -hmm. there's the conundrum how do we you know you're asking to change the human situation if you mm -hmm. if you pursue too far that line of thought um, and I don't know anyone starting with people in uniform who wouldn't like that transformation to occur yeah. uh, brief comments uh, by Professor Sharkey and then Professor Kasher I would have to uh Bow to your superior wisdom on on the co the cause of the length of the war in Iraq, Admiral. Uh, and I or don't Afghanistan, think Afghanistan. Yeah. Sorry, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. I don't think it's been caused by the. I thought I thought she said Iraq. Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't think it's been caused by the robots. I don't think that's created a greater duration either yet. Um, however, I notice as the United States pulls out, well, as the Allies pull out of uh, Iraq. What's happening now is there's a greater use of drones, mm -hmm. and one of the one of the big DARPA that's the Defence Research Agency for the military. Mm -hmm. One of the big DARPA projects is called Project Vulture. <laughs> now, Project Vulture has just been awarded to Boeing for developing a UAV with persistence of five years that can carry a thousand pound payload. Mm. Okay. So far Boeing have developed a prototype, a very large plane that can stay aloft for a month. Mm -hmm. Now whether you would call that war or not, I can see that the aim here is you fight the war but then you pull out all your troops but you leave the UAVs floating constantly overhead. Mm -hmm. Now whether you're prepared to call that still being at war or not, I don't know, or whether you're just doing surveillance and a bit of killing here and there. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Professor Kasher. I think ironically one should look at the weaker party mm -hmm. in the conflict in order to see why it takes so long mm -hmm. because they would look at the weaponry they use, okay, i.e. improvised explosive devices which yeah. everyone can produce, mm -hmm. suicide bombers which almost everyone can produce. Mm -hmm. So I mean as long as the weaker, weaker party can use types of tactics which do not involve sophisticated weaponry but just involve the primitive way of producing them and the willingness to, to, to use them, then the war lasts. Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, please step <coughs> forward and state your name and question. Uh, name is Norman Robbins. Uh, you've alluded uh, several times to the threshold for war and Article 51 self-defense, and I'd like to ask you to discuss um, when, if ever, preemptive war mm. is justified. Uh, in this country, we've had our nose bloodied with the uh, preemptive war in Iraq, mm. where it turned out mm. that the major premise, WMD, was false and uh, that there was a lot, as the gentleman from France mentioned, there was a lot of media that led to that, quote, <laughs> democratic support. Mm -hmm. And I, I see us uh, having that same situation now with respect to Iran, uh, where even they're thinking about uh, getting a capability, uh, et cetera, a lot of uh, words like that, uh, in some minds is a justification 
for an attack now as a, pre pre as a preemptive. So my question is, uh, uh, what should be uh, the uh, true justification for preemptive war, knowing full well, as, as many of you uh, uh, certainly acknowledge, the great uh, death and destruction that it will bring about? Uh, I think David first, and then. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's a really good question. Um, there's nothing new about preemption. There's nothing new about the challenge of preemption, and there's nothing new about the dangers of not acting. Raymond of Penafort um, wrote in, I think it was the 12th century, mm. trying to uh, trying to work out uh, when it was justified to use uh, lethal force, um, and he said he used the example of an ambush, coming across an ambush that you're about to be ambushed by. Mm. They haven't done anything yet, but if you attack them, you're the aggressor. And he makes it clear, no, you're not the aggressor. If, there's a, if you're about to be ambushed, but you take the first action because you're, you've managed to discover the ambush, you are still acting in self-defense. And that is the key. It's not a new idea, but that is the key. Are you acting in self-defense? Or are you imagining or predicting a threat, a distant threat, without any hard intention without any capability and without any imminence and are you saying this might at some point be a threat to us therefore we're going to eliminate it and getting the balance right between that which is offensive aggressive war and preemption which can be legitimate which is when you are facing a threat and you act before that threat manifests itself in 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 a, in a way that is going to hurt you or other parties or other innocent um, actors. As long as you can get that balance right, you are acting in self-defense rather than aggressive war. But it's getting that balance right. And then, again, there's no simple formula that says this is self-defense, this is prevention rather than preemption. It is not justified ethically. There's no, there's no simple formula that you can, you can say which one it is. It, it, but getting the balance right is absolutely essential. Professor Lucas. Well, I think there are two issues at stake there, uh, and one of them is, is the cause for war or cause for using force, if I may put it that way, and the other is a procedure for deciding whether to do so or not. You may have a good reason to use force, but you may not have the authorization or the jurisdiction to do so. Um, and I think the second was far more troublesome in the case of Iraq than the first. There were amply good reasons for being concerned about that country and its leadership. Uh, there have been in the past, there were then at the time, uh, and there are other places in the world where these kinds of concerns that are like the Raymond of Penafort ambush, uh, Iran building nuclear weapons in a country rich with oil is an example, uh, and certainly the Israeli attack upon the Iraqi nuclear reactor under construction at Osiris, there was nothing but mischief to come from allowing that to go online. Uh, the question is always one of jurisdiction. Um, Article 51 grants nations who are signatories to the UN Charter, uh, nothing in that charter will, will abrogate their individual right of self-defense, and that would be, I think, the justification for the Israeli strike in 1981, I think it was. Um, the problem we faced in Iraq was the we had moved from a case of something like an ambush to something like suspicion that an ambush was underway uh, without as much certainty. And one would have wished for something like the analog of a, uh, an arrest warrant uh, procedure where you took your evidence to the judge and some you know, reasonably impartial party looked at it and said, yes, you have a case or no, you don't have a case. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was what was missing in, in that instance. I think if you're going to talk about not really pre preemptive, but preventive war, wars to, in, to interdict and prevent criminal conspiracies from raining death and destruction on innocent persons, we need a better way of the international community coping with that uh, and deciding not only that there is a cause, but who will be delegated or deputized and whether or not the cause has risen to a level that a, you know, a, an, a, a fair fair and reasonable procedure, which we just don't have in the UN yet, uh, could be developed that would, that would authorize a use of force for the protection of citizens living under the rule of law in those cases. Did you want to make yes. a quick... Uh, I fully agree with David and George, but I'd like to add two considerations. For, and, and they are from just war doctrine, uh, uh, and, but 
should be applied in a, uh, in a new way to those circumstances of Iran that you mentioned. First of all, there is the consideration of proportionality taken in the most abstract sense of the, what you gain should justify the, the harm you cause to innocent parties. Okay. Now, you can, draw, you can try to, uh, to, to draw the picture of what you gain on the one hand and what, you, uh, and what is going to be lost on, on the other hand where you count the damage as if it's damage to your own, your own people. Now, a most difficult consideration is the other type. Namely, it's self-defense, it's proportional, but is it the last resort? Mm. Now, that's the most difficult question to answer because you have to convince yourself in a morally justifiable way that you have already exhausted all other means for in attempt to solve this problem and they all failed now when do you reach the conclusion that all of them failed mm. when it's very difficult under most circumstances it's very difficult so if you speak about iran i think self-defense is there proportionality in there but last resort is in the dark mm. thank you very much yeah. next question please Hi, uh, my name is Daria. I'm with the National Peace Academy and the Hegel <coughs> Institute for Nonviolence. And so my question kind of relates back to what Dr. French was talking about, which is the definition of war in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And so uh, war, as we understand it, is right, um, an interstate, uh, or, sorry, a, a conflict between two states, and we create a domain in which we delineate between citizens and non-citizens, civilians and non-civilians, combatants and non-combatants, and then apply an ethical criteria. But as we've um, talked about today, we have all these extra um, situations that arise outside this domain. So mm -hmm. insurgencies where we, um, or counterinsurgencies where we um, are justified in using, um, or having civilian casualties, or dropping bunker busters in you know, the outskirts of Pakistan, and mm -hmm. civilian damage there now is now incidental and part of the foreseeable calculation. Or civilian warfare, or sorry, not civilian, um, Civil warfare, where it's okay for us to um, uh, use chemical weapons um, uh, and also um, the the use um, or the, the treatment of um, you know uh, combatants or enemy combatants uh, that goes against the Geneva Convention and against the rights of human dignity. Uh, we've created these situations where. The, since they're outside of the traditional definition of war, the ethics of war no longer apply. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, um, is it time that we now reimagine the uh, definition of warfare to include all these extra cir circumstances so that at the very least, even if we're not, um, even if we're not um, leaving, or sorry, even if we don't, uh, even if we advocate that killing is okay and um, killing civilians is okay, that we have now uh, expanded our definition of warfare to include all these other situations where we could at least consistently apply these ethical criteria that's only apply to ethical war, um, to just war, or sorry, to warfare in a traditional sense, but not to insurgencies, civil war, um, counterterrorism efforts, and things like that. Interesting. David, yes. I, I'd stop. The, the, there's a reason they call it the law of armed conflict rather than the law of war, and that's because it applies in armed conflict, not just recognize the legal definition of war, which is between two states, which you're quite right. We don't, we don't do war in a legal sense anymore because two sovereign political entities do not declare war on each other. Why? Because it's illegal. You can't declare war on something. You can act in self-defense, in which case the other party already has done something wrong. But they're not going to declare war on you because that would be illegal. Mm -hmm. That would be the crime of aggression. We don't have that anymore. <laughs> Honest. Um, we so, don't any longer just say, I like your vineyards, I'm going to attack. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so, but, but armed conflict is war in the non narrow legal sense. It's still, and, and you're quite right, counterinsurgency is, 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 is war. It's war in the, in the commonly understood sense, if not in the very narrow legal definition of what war is. It's armed conflict. Mm -hmm. um, I could talk a lot. I, I know other people want to, to, to come in, so I think it's worth just mentioning. There's a thing called the Martins Clause in all um, 20th century um, law of armed conflict. You'll find the Martins Clause. And effectively, I can't remember exactly what the Martins Clause says, but its flavor is just because it's not written down in a law book, does not mean you can do it, <laughs> okay? It, in a nutshell, what it says is, we might not have captured everything in this particular piece of law that we're saying applies to war. Mm -hmm. If we haven't, rely on the ethical principles. Mm -hmm. Where law fails, rely on the ethical principles. If it's customary, you do it anyway, even if it's not written down. If it is a violent assault 
on the conscience of humankind, mm. just because the law doesn't say it's illegal doesn't mean you can do it. Mm. It's wrong. And the Martins Clause, you'll find it in the Geneva Conventions, it's, very, it's just a little paragraph, and it just says, just because it's not written down doesn't mean it's okay. Mm. And that's so where there's a vacuum to. in the law, it doesn't mean you can fill that vacuum with anything you want. You Absolutely. are supposed to apply the ethical Absolutely. principles. Uh, uh, w would others like to jump in on this question? Uh, I to say that, yeah. uh, I mean, he, sa he said everything that he <laughs> much more expertly than I could. But I think there's, there's a distinction that we keep hearing about policing operations nowadays, mm. uh, which somehow are... I never get this thing about policing operations because policing has different sets of rules and laws to warfare. So for instance, if, if someone's holding hostages, you don't bomb the building. Mm -hmm. Police are much more careful about collateral damage. <laughs> I don't think police are allowed any collateral damage at all. So I think it's important, rather than call it all war warfare, would be actually to do the opposite and pull it apart and mm -hmm. have different sets of rules for policing operations than you have for other warfare. I would have I would have a very short answer to the to your question and to the last one um, <clears throat> regarding preemption. Uh, you do not know what is your adversary intention. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so should you trust? Should you distrust? Uh, uh, even perfidy is always possible in human relation. Mm -hmm. So what, what should you presume when you are uh, in responsibility, when you are the political leadership, you know? Um, because there is a, a mortal risk, uh, a vital risk uh, mm -hmm. at stake. So we come back to the f one of the, your first questions, Shannon, what additional risk Mm. Should we take not only in the field, but in uh, well, uh, in life uh, at large? Um, well, and uh, it is obvious that if the answer is we will never take any kind of such risk, mm -hmm. then. Well, it is a Hobbesian uh, concept of uh, uh, political community which emerges, and uh, obviously we were driven to uh, just a um, uh, politique de force. Uh, I know. Okay, so it seems to me that when we feel cornered, uh, in the problems of war, uh, we should uh, think that before being cornered, uh, we should have thought more about peace mm. uh, in when it was possible, and maybe it is always uh, possible. And uh, so, so you too would say that uh, we we mustn't give up on last resort too quickly, or, or jump too quickly to last resort. Yes, and uh, in order to build, uh, in order to build trust, in order to build trust, uh, probably uh, we have to acknowledge mm. some kind of uh, good faith. Uh, I mean, I mean, probably your adversary wants to harm you, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, good faith is not that. Mm -hmm. uh, good, when I take presume some kind of good faith means to understand that uh, your adversary is not always and necessarily a supremely unjust mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. or uh, leadership and that it has some kind of idea of justice. You can disagree with Okay, and uh, you can find well rather unjust, limited, imperfect, uh, and yet, and yet, he, uh, your adversary is not acting only on bad intentions as a, a gangster or an evildoer. This happens sometimes, but not always. Huh? And so we have to understand this kind of tragical pluralism in the ideas of justice. Mm -hmm. It's not only, as Rawls believed, the ideas of good, which are many. It is the ideas of justice, which are many. And so we are not get, getting out of the problem with his theory of justice, you know? Yeah. So, so the problem is 
uh, diplomacy, you know, can we figure out some kind of world uh, where perfectly we can make fitting together very imperfectly different ideas of justice, or is that compromise by itself unjust? This is the choice, you know, to be made. Uh, compromise or not compromising, uh, it, not only in domestic policy, but also in world policy. There's a lot of elements in that, and the, the point about um, the potential need to compromise in some cases, but also your point about respecting different views of justice and not going into a conflict with the assumption that your enemy does not have a concept of justice, even if it differs from Well, your own. it could be dehumanizing mm -hmm. uh, for everybody, not assuming that we all refer to some kind of same ideal justice, which would be all embracing, sort of all embracing idea of justice. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, uh, and we see that quite, this quite well in domestic policy, that we, um, we are sensitive, more sensitive to some dimension of justice. Mm -hmm. I would talk about dimensions of justice as we talk about dimensions of time or of space, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, uh, when, I, uh, when I listen to your uh, debates, which was so articulate and fair, by the way, and gorgeous, <laughs> which Thank is, uh, uh, well, uh, it seems that your republic is working not so, not this bad, you know? <laughs> uh, for, I th saying that from a foreign point of view. <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, it seems to me that, well, uh, everything is true, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the, there is some kind of tragedy, you know, in, in life. Well, this uh, try. I don't want to be too. I don't want mm. to be too long. Excuse me. <laughs> no, thank you for your thoughts. Um, next up, uh, Roger. Yes, my name is Roger Cram, and I teach courses at Hiram College about the disadvantages of new technology. Mm. And I don't know whether this story is true or not, but six weeks ago on national public radio, a former CIA agent was interviewed who is still active with the State Department. He said that two months ago, an armed drone aircraft was taken over from signals coming up from Tel Aviv. And it was thrown, the aircraft was flown for miles out to a, believe it or not, topless beach <laughs> where the aircraft circled for an hour aiming the cameras down on the women. <laughs> now, it was later found that it was a 17 and a 19-year-old hacker <laughs> that had done this. Uh, true or not, when we fly our weapons by remote signals, especially if they're armed, how, what is the likelihood of advanced hackers being able to take over these weapon systems? I feel like this is a question for you, Noel. <laughs> well, as, uh, George has already mentioned the uh, cyber warfare, and I think that uh, when you've got a remote control machine, it's particularly susceptible to being taken over. I don't know about that particular instance. You might know if, it, if it's true. Or not. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about it. Uh, but I do know that, uh, for instance, the the Taliban were found w on their laptops with with film footage from the drones and a piece of software they bought in Sweden for ten dollars. Yeah. And that's all it took. But I think that the trouble is that um, if you go away from the remote control, I mean, one of the big drives at the moment, which we've not discussed here, in all of the United States military plans for the, since 2004 have been go towards autonomous systems. Mm. So they're not hackable in the same way because you've not got the remote link, the wireless link, and they're not jammable either. So that's why there's a big drive towards them. But for me, that's a much worse scenario <laughs> because you've got machines that can't discriminate between combat 
inhabitants and civilians at all. And so we start using those. So you're taking the human out of the loop altogether in those? You're taking a human out of the loop altogether. Uh, I mean, there's talk about doing it in stages. So if you've got a human on the loop with one person in executive control of many machines. But again, if they're, if they're in executive control of many machines, that's a kind of fantasy because it takes away the whole point of having them autonomous. Uh, because you need them, you need them to be autonomous, even for things like dog fighting. But if you go into deep missions, and if you're fighting a nation such as China or, the, or Russia, not the Taliban, somebody who's technological sophisticated, they will be able to jam the signals. They'll be able to jam the satellite signals, be able to jam the radio signals. But for me, that this is a much, much worse scenario than having people take over the drones and look at women in topless beaches. Well, um, that they can also, if they take over the drones, they can send our own weapons against us. Yeah, we'll stop using them. <laughs> His answer is stop using them. I would also uh, just mention in this context that uh, uh, some of the folks on the stage here, but uh, other uh, scholars at a number of institutions, including this one, are involved in a uh, research consortium to look at some of these issues. So if those of you who have interest, uh, it is called SETMONS, which is a very long acronym, but it stands for a Consortium on Emerging Technology, Military Operations, and National Security. And uh, it is uh, for scholars interested in this subject, and I, I I direct you to the, the setmons.org website for more questions of this nature. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, my name is Zoe Economos, and I'm um, 13. <laughs> thank uh, you for joining us. Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, um, my view of peace, I have never known war before in my life, and my view of peace is completely void of war. <laughs> So when you tell, when people tell us that war is simply a way to manufacture peace, I would ask you, why? Hmm. Wendy, yes. I don't think it's a way to manufacture peace. Mm -hmm. I think it's a way at times to return to a peace. Mm -hmm. It's fortunate that you've never known war. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good thing. There are many people in many nations at your age who have known nothing but violence. And I would ask you even, what's the definition of peace? We've talked a lot about what's the definition of war. But there are times when you can say that in the avoidance of warfare, because nations do not resort to conflict, that there are citizens of different nations who are subjected to a lack of peace all the time, mm -hmm. uh, physically and in their spirits, or the, the oppression that they go through. Is that lack of warfare peace for them? Does Do you automatically transcend from your either at war or at peace? Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are, those are certainly things to think about. Um, in my own thought about it, and I think about the, the women and the children and there's a UN Security Council resolution that was passed about 10 years ago called 1325 that I would invite you to go and read. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how the brunt of, of warfare, but I would say the brunt of a lack of peace globally, <laughs> impacts women and children in a way that it doesn't impact men. Mm -hmm. And in many cases that's because in different societies or nations, women could not even stand in a microphone situation like you're doing right now mm. to be able to address that kind of a question. Mm. And moving forward, much of the research that's been done in the last 10 or 15 years, and there's a, a really fine article, I think written about five years ago by a group of researchers at Harvard, talk about statistically over the course of hundreds of years, the impact on women and children of warfare. Mm. And that if we in fact increase the education of women, mm. we, and, and we provide opportunity for them, that by nature we therefore secure more peaceful circumstances and that warfare is something that is, is not resorted to as often. There are uh, many instances where there are crimes of humanity perpetrated against women, particularly in the form of rape or terror kind of situations like that or oppression that some would define as short of warfare, but certainly could not be 
you know, in any way construed as a, a way for them to have a peaceful and abundant life. So I, I'm happy that you have had the absence of warfare in your life and that you have had peace. And I have a daughter who's 20 who I hope never knows those kinds of circumstances that other women are subject to in other nations. And I would tell you that I think one of the things that's very important is as we look to secure peace, that we do it on a basis that's not only across the lines of, of countries so that we're not at war, but that in fact the kind of existence that people have is one of opportunity and one of liberty and one of education and one of peace that they have an ability to feel secure no matter where they are. Uh, another comment, uh, Asa. I wish I could speak like yourself. I mean, saying that I've never experienced anything but peace. I have never experienced anything but war and truth between different wars. Now, I think you, you got the picture somewhat wrong. I mean, the picture is not that first we have peace, then somebody comes with the idea of having war in order to have peace. The picture is that you have something which is unacceptable which could be a war of one type or another, which could be genocide uh, or, uh, and, and, and other, other circumstances. Then you, you wage a war in order to stop that activity, which is horrendous. But when you wage a war and you carry it out, you have to constantly think about what's going to happen after the war has ended. And you have to think about peace. So waging a war is not just gaining victory over your enemy. Waging a war in the proper way is to gain victory over your enemy, but in a way that enables all of the, in the involved parties to strike a peace among themselves when the war ends. I know, uh, George, you've written extensively about just peace. Did you want to throw in a comment? Well, I guess the, the addendum to this would be that even if we could envision that dream in the in the folk song of all the people from all the nations coming together and signing a document in which they renounced war, we mm. essentially had that in the United Nations Convention, 1948. Mm. Uh, that was what it was intended to do. Um, what do we do with a convention like that that grants the member parties, the signatories to the document, the unlimited right to do unlimited wrong within their own borders? Mm the sort of thing that Admiral mm -hmm. Carpenter is referring to. Mm -hmm. What about the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. What about the people of Rwanda? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, what we need and don't have yet is a way of protecting peace-loving individuals who are going about their own business and minding their own business, whether as a collective entity, as a nation, or as individuals within their nation, from being harassed and abused and threatened with violence and death. Um, I think it's right not to call that concern war. Uh, it's instead law enforcement. And we mm -hmm. do not have any reasonable mechanisms other than the ad hoc way we go about it now in the current international order for protecting the rights of vulnerable peoples in Darfur or in, 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 in Rwanda, uh, in Israel, in, in wherever they may be. Um, we don't have a right. Uh, or a, a method of doing that. And so we rely on what are customs of war insofar as they can be made to fit this to try and, and accomplish this. This is why Afghanistan lingers on. It's not that anybody wishes to make war on the poor Afghan people. It's rather that what kind of, of state can be established so those people will be able to live their lives without living in the threat and terror of, of continued ongoing criminal activity that will threaten their security. Uh, we don't have any good answer to that. We don't have any good way of protecting them. And the way we're doing it now isn't particularly good. Uh, but it's all we have. And so what we do is look to people like yourselves to come up with better instruments than the ones that we currently have, less conflicted, self-interested instruments uh, that would guard the rights uh, and the security of vulnerable peoples. And the fact that you're here listening to this conversation and that you care gives us all, I think, a bit of hope. And we appreciate your presence. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Tick. Good morning. Uh, 
due to the time, I'll try to be very brief. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you for all of your work. I want to recommend Shannon French's book to everyone, The Code of the Warrior, and uh, it's quite fitting that we begin our discussion with the ethics of war. And your book, Shannon, as well as other works, make clear how utterly important it is to have guiding moral and ethical principles at every level, from protecting civilians and the ecology and infrastructure to our troops who will actually do the combat and all the way up to leadership. Uh, some of the comments, uh, of course, are compelling and disturbing, and I want to bring up this point. I have worked with veterans from all over the world and from every, uh, m many of the wars in living memory for over 31 years. There is no compelling justification to a soldier who has been in combat for taking a civilian life. There is no compelling justification when a, sol a, a so combatant decides before, during, or after the conflict that the causes or the gains were illegitimate. Mm. And there is no compelling justification to a combatant when they determine that their war was not truly and exclusively a last resort. Mm. The only justification I have ever encountered in working with combatants all over the world is when they absolutely, unquestionably determined that they fought and had to kill in order to protect the immediate and absolute threat to their families, their children's mm -hmm. lives, their homes. Mm -hmm. In every other case, except those who have psychopathic tendencies, our combatants break down in what we call post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. and moral trauma is at its heart. Mm -hmm. So how do we apply the ethical standards all of you are representing so well and at such a high level that the conscience of our combatants and our civilians are absolutely and unconditionally protected. Excellent question. Yes, thank you. Uh, who, who would like to take this uh, first? I think uh, Wendy and then Asa. Yeah. That's, that's an outstanding point. Um, I have had people who have worked for me, who have come back and gone through that post-traumatic stress. My own father went through that from Vietnam. No one at that point in time, although they categorized it as PTSD, no one offered assistance. Um, I would tell you in my own faith that I believe fundamentally if someone particularly is going to, you know, for ASA, they have the conscripts, but we now have a volunteer force in the United States, and yet the volunteers sometimes will come back with those same kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. There are a number of really fine books written by actually one gal, a psychologist who was in Iraq, mm -hmm. who came back having been a psychologist there who was supposed to be, and I'll use the term ministering to our troops on the ground, and yet no one was asking her how she was doing, mm -hmm. okay? And, and it even parallels, I would tell you, friends of mine who are doctors in emergency rooms in places like Los Angeles mm -hmm. who go through that same kind of trauma and stress. And when we were dispatching troops to Haiti to be on the ground for the, for the kinds of operations they were gonna be doing there for relief, one of the first things I did, because I'm a psychology major, I'm not an engineer, okay? One of the first things I did was email the four star who was sending our folks down there and say, sir, please consider dispatching now people who will be trained to minister to the troops, spiritually, emotionally, medically, because of what they're going to see. The the onslaught on their consciences of doing relief efforts where we were not even in warfare, mm. okay? And the fact that they couldn't intercede, especially for the children to save the children was so traumatic for many of them. And this is something that we have to grapple with as in the United States and I think globally about any relief effort, any wartime scenario that we have people who are traumatized by these things. I would say even probably our policemen and firefighters, certainly the ones who responded after 9-11.
Um, this is something that we have to do. And I believe within my heart that it's not just a psychology piece, but it's a whole of person piece, and that much of that has to come from a spiritual aspect of how does that individual deal with it from a spiritual perspective, particularly knowing that they may have volunteered to go into that situation and then not fully <coughs> understood what it is that they were gonna get into. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems for many, many years um, through movies, through books, is that there is almost a glamour to war mm -hmm. um, or to these kinds of things and people are sometimes attracted to do careers for the wrong reasons mm -hmm. when they may not be well prepared mm -hmm. to handle the aftermath of what their choices are. <coughs> I would like to let a few more of our panelists uh, respond to this question. I would, I'm very apologetic to those of you who've been waiting patiently in line there. We are gonna run out of time, however, let me say this, uh, that um, I, our, I'm going to impose on our gracious panelists uh, to hang around a little bit after the panel and perhaps you could, those of you who have not gotten a chance, I do apologize, you could come up and, and speak to them uh, and ask them your question. But now since we are, are so close to running out of time, I'd like any of them to make uh, further comments uh, in, in uh, response perhaps to our, our keynote speaker, Ed Tick's uh, final question there. Um, why don't we even just begin, uh, can we go just sort of down the line then, uh, or, or skip around, I don't care. <laughs> Henri. <laughs> okay, thank you, Shannon. Um, war is a tragedy. And uh, we should take a, a tragedy in a very precise meaning, and which is something that sometimes you cannot avoid, you cannot prevent from. Uh, happening without allowing something else happening which is uh, maybe even worse. Uh, I remember uh, Tullius Kikero uh, talks, uh, writes somewhere uh, a story of two wrecked people uh, well not fighting but trying to grasp, to, to grasp the same uh, <clears throat> the same wood, floating wood, mm -hmm. which is quite insufficient to bear both of them. Mm. We could add maybe there are siblings, mm. maybe there are friends, maybe there are enemies. In any case, it, this is tragedy, you know? And uh, uh, we come to moments, to times in life where one life should be exchanged, mm -hmm. trade as it were, for one other life. And which one uh, should we take? Mm -hmm. um, when we come to such situation, either in war or elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that um, mere selfishness and self-interesting or uh, mere utilitarian ways of thinking are quite uh, inappropriate and um, become, well, base. Um, dignity needs, human dignity in tragedy uh, needs, we keep higher grounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is not possible, it is not possible to reach uh, these grounds uh, without studying the concept of sacrifice and self-sacrifice. Kierkegaard uh, made this point quite clear that ethics is reasonably easy to deal with until we come to the point where <laughs> sacrifice happens. Mm. And then it seems that the concept of universal uh, uh, crumbles. Mm. That's why. Uh, I do not have the, the answers to all questions, huh? and, uh, I would like, but I, I really I, I do not. Uh, but what I can, um, I can bear witness that when I was appointed at Sincere Military Academy, uh, well, they suppose I knew. <laughs> and uh, uh, quickly I realized 
that in fact uh, talking about war mm -hmm. uh, made necessary a complete reworking of moral philosophy Ugh. you know this is w when we come to war and to peace it is absolutely necessary to deepen 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 in fact all the questions the military ask you I can tell you, first time I, I talked with the colonel, I was taking a drink with him, he told me, well, I was somewhere, some, such, such year, I was in, in Serbia, mm -hmm. and such thing happened to me. Mm -hmm. I had to trigger or not to trigger. Mm -hmm. uh, should I trigger? If you can help me to answer, should I trigger or should, not, should I not? Uh. You are useful in this academy, otherwise <sighs> you are not. Well, oh my. <laughs> so... I think we uh, should address uh, the true, uh, the, all the questions w which emerge from the genuine uh, will to uh, eradicate war, uh, not to be satisfied with um, shallow answers, you know, because war is deeply rooted in every in everyone, you know, mm -hmm. and there is a, a lust for power and a lust for war. Which is which we must uh, acknowledge. Uh, we must uh, not acknowledge. We must uh, um, observe mm -hmm. and analyze. Mm -hmm. Well, now I realize I, um, Asa, you actually had your hand up earlier. I don't want you to forget your point that uh, we have rolled yeah, past it. I will but never forget it. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'd like to address the issue raised by the last person who uh, who posed the question. Uh, I think that the issue is much broader and much deeper. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, behaving in an unjust way. Assume I'm perfectly justified in what I'm doing. And what I'm doing involves killing a terrorist who jeopardizes the life of my family on the one end, as well as killing as collateral damage three of his neighbors. Now, I'm perfectly justified. Assume I'm perfectly justified in doing it. Still, I come home and I, I have mixed feelings. I'm delighted to have been able to protect my family, my family, my compatriots. I'm delighted, extremely delighted. On the other hand, I'm very sorry. I'm extremely sorry to have taken the life of three people who are innocent in the sense of not dangerous, not jeopardizing the life of anybody. Mm -hmm. So I have those mixed feelings. So moral psychology enters the picture not just when we commit some atrocities. When we do the perfect action, when we carry out the perfect action, which is perfectly justified, we still have that kind of mixed feelings. Mm -hmm. Moreover, assume there is no collateral damage. Assume I am a, some, I, I'm a helicopter pilot. I kill the terrorist in order to save the lives of my compatriots. I return home. I'm delighted to have saved the life of my compatriots. I hate it that I have to kill people. Mm. But I ought to do it. I'm perfectly justified when I do it. But although the person I killed was not innocent at all, although he was a terrorist, he was arch-terrorist, still I feel sorry when I kill him. So, so moral psychology should be applied to people who find themselves, on we call it tragedy. I think it's the right term. Whatever you're going to do, it's going to have some two aspects, one about which you're happy, one about which you're awfully sad. And, and so, in, not only in PTSD cases, which is much too late, I mean in training, in instruction, in, 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 in briefing, in debriefing, at every stage when you carry out or you, you command people who carry out uh, such activities, you have to take it into account. You have to cultivate those two emotions. Be very proud and show perseverance and be courageous when you defend your compatriots and, your, and when you protect your force, who are also compatriots. But never forget that it's human dignity 
which is inalienable whoever is that person there. If he is a terrorist, an arch terrorist, he's still a person. I have to kill him. I, I will do it again tomorrow. But I'm not, I don't like doing it. I have to do it, and I do it. And I find myself with those mixed feelings. And that a, a, should be a regular, a regular reaction of, of combatants. And I think when I speak to pilots and, and, and people of, of other branches in the Israeli Defense Force, it's an ordinary, it's a regular, ordinary mixture of feelings that people have. David. The, you talk, you very eloquently put it about the, the moral trauma at the heart of, of many PTSD. And I think um, Lisa's is quite right. You, it's something that if people are better prepared for, you can minimize, but you can never eliminate. You cannot just remove moral trauma. If you could, then we're into the robotic world of, 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 of automatons, which I don't think anybody really wants to, to, to go completely over, uh, over to. We, d we don't want that. Killing should be difficult. There should be a cost, a human cost mm -hmm. internally. But we have to accept that when we put people into this situation, we, when, us, when we send our men and women to war, not only have we got to equip them to cope with what we're asking them to do, we've got to look after them afterwards as well. And that's part of the proportionality calculation, is what you're doing, and this is part of your proportionality calculation, the cost to your own people, the cost to your society, the cost to the relationships, the cost to the marriages, the cost to the children, of the long-term implications of what you're doing to your people, is what you're going to war, is it proportional? It, are the ends justified? Do the ends justify what, what, you've, what you've got to do? Um, so the proportionality calculation is very important. There's a very sad statistic in the UK from the Falklands conflict in, in the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, more Falklands veterans have died at their own hands through suicide uh. post-conflict than died in the conflict. Mm. The duty of care we owe after the conflict is just as profound as the duty of care before. In the UK at the moment, our veterans have, have, a, have a very high profile. I live in a town called Wooten Bassett, which is no reason why anybody here would have heard of. But it's, the first, <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful first, town. Wonderful it's, a, town. It's, a, it's a wonderful town, but it's, it's also the first town that the uh, repatriated casualties, the, the, the dead from Afghanistan, come through after coming into RAF Lynham. Mm -hmm. And the people of Wooten Bassett come out and pay their respects every time. And it's, it, it, it's always national news, and regrettably it's national news about once or twice a week at the moment, it's, 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 mm -hmm. but it's always, it always makes the headlines as it should. Mm -hmm. My fear is that 10 years from now, after the supposed drawdown, when we've left, those veterans will become forgotten once mm -hmm. more and that we may see a repeat of what happened um, after the Falklands and I really hope we don't, we don't do that again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Noel? Well, um, like Wendy, I was a psych major as well, <laughs> strangely. And I've also worked in psychiatric hospitals, so I've been involved in therapy, but never with, uh, never with army soldiers in post-traumatic stress. So I've seen post-traumatic stress. And you have to be very careful as a therapist. I've looked a lot at the research of it. And then sometimes mm -hmm. therapists are actually supposed to be causing the post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. because they get in there and ask the questions. But I don't think it's the case with this kind of stress. But you know, uh, strangely, we've made a lot of progress uh, and we're calling it post-traumatic stress. At one point it might have been called shell shock and the other times it might have been called cowardice and people would have been shot for it. Mm. But at least it's progress to look at the, the idea of therapy. But on the other hand, it actually gives me the idea that soldiers are suffering post-traumatic stress gives me great hope for humanity, in mm. fact because uh, you, you probably know there's a, a lot of historians have written right back from Brigadier General Marshall, who people suspect was, you know, data might have been a bit suspect, where he talks about the soldiers during World War II, that so, the vast majority of them shot over the heads of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the enemy. Mm -hmm. And there have been many, the Civil War here, the Battle of Gettysburg, they've retrieved thousands of muskets from the battlefield mm -hmm. and found that they were multiply loaded, so people mm -hmm. weren't even shooting. And you can tell from the sort of face-to-face -face conflict and historians have even gone back as far as Alexander the Great and said he only lost 30 soldiers in all his conflicts because they never retreated and it's much easier to kill people in the back than it is killing them face to face. So that's one of the very strange things of war and I think that uh, 
David Grossman now has this whole thing of killology, the, mm -hmm. the, the idea now you don't get this business of people shooting over the heads. People actually are trained, immersed trained, not in ethics, they're immersed trained in killing. Mm -hmm. And so they will kill. And this is the side effect of that, really, of training soldiers to really mm -hmm. kill. But the idea, it, it sounds grotesque of me to say this, but the idea that so many of them are suffering from post-traumatic stress to me gives me a great deal of hope, in fact, rather than, rather than anything else. Mm -hmm. Um, Admiral, you, you had a uh, response already. Would you care to add anything or have you? No, I think those are all great points and, and it is true that uh, you know there is a great deal of compassion. We do train people um, in the art of warfare. Um, fundamentally the military is about warfare. Now I am I am charged to to fight and win the nation's wars if we if we in fact go to war. But I would tell you that our military strategies are out there now, particularly the maritime strategy, is that it's just important to preserve the peace as it is to be ready to go to war. So we posture ourselves to do all of those things. But when you, when you subject someone to um, those, you know, those combat situations and they have to make a decision based upon training and based upon the things that are expected of them, and people die as a result. That is, that is what we have to do is, is be able to deal with that when they come back and develop those kinds of programs that we didn't, you know, many years ago didn't deal with that. Um, it's it's very frequent now that you'll actually hear senior commanders talk about their own experiences in that, but that does imply, thankfully, that there's a level of caring and compassion. But I will also tell you that. Our, our political leadership is very taken back by every single person that is a casualty or dies. I mean, I, I think probably if the truth were known, there are some of them who, although they have not been in combat, are feeling um, a great deal and, and would probably even need uh, you know, some types of, of counseling or help themselves, depending upon the position that they're actually in as a political leader, because I don't, I get a daily download of every casualty that's going on, mm. even though I'm not in command of those individuals, I care about where they are and what they're going through, mm. um, and, and what the repercussions are for a society and, and globally for that. Because in many cases, you know, when we, when we, and I spoke to the young lady earlier, the 13-year-old that got up, and thank you for coming, mm -hmm. and thank you for asking your question, that in the aftermath of war, people who are not being dealt with adequately in many other nations, in, in the wars in their own regions, or the civil wars in their own regions, may be so filled with issues and anger that then they go and perpetuate other uh, catastrophic or, 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 or tragic events against their own populations as a result of those kinds of things. So it's a very serious issue and one that I think um, we need to not only look into, you know, for the, for the United States, but certainly globally, what do we do to deal with those kinds of things so that we equip our people to go back into society no matter where they're going to. Dr. Lucas, I'm going to give you the last comment. Well, I wonder if many of you sitting out there have found these last two hours d disturbing, confusing, and perhaps unsatisfying. Well, you should. Um, the present state of conflict in the 21st century is disturbing, very confusing, and quite unsatisfying. My concern personally is that our men and women whom we put in uniform and place in harm's way somehow maintain the sense of what their role and purpose and their vision is in the midst of this very confusing, disturbing, and unsatisfying situation in which we place them. They're tough and good people and they have had a traditional way of summing up what their role is in all of this. They will say, and have said in my presence many times, we are the pointy end of the spear. Our job is to go out and kill people and break things when you, the government, or the people order us to do so until somebody orders us to stop. And my rejoinder and present is usually, well, that may have been so. But now, unfortunately, the confusing, disturbing, and unsatisfying thing is there are plenty of people already out there in the darker regions of the new global order who are killing people 
breaking things and generally doing all they can to make human life for everyone as miserable as possible. Your job is to interpose yourself between them and their victims and order them to stop. Let's thank all of our panelists.